Greetings, Bill Mobley for the Brain Channel on UCTV. I'm very pleased to have as a guest Dr. Joe Gleason. He's a professor of neurosciences and pediatrics at UCSD. And Joe has pursued a very interesting career in which he's uh, combined an interest in developmental brain disorders and genetics. Uh, Joe, thanks for being with me. It's my pleasure. I'm very excited to be here. Tell me a little bit about you and about the work you do. My background's in child neurology. And during my clinical training, when I was seeing patients in the hospital, I became frustrated that we really couldn't make specific diagnosis in very many patients, maybe 5% or so. The rest of them, we'd throw up our hands, we'd try our best and use whatever sort of treatment was we thought going to make the most sense. Uh, when I went into the research lab, uh, after I finished my clinical training, I started to work with animal models. And I noticed that a lot of the models we were working with resembled my patients in some way but I felt that um, we were really underpowered to understand our patients in the way we could in a defined environment like the research lab. So I thought the best way forward to improve the way we diagnose patients and improve care in general in children with neurodevelopmental disorders is to recruit some special populations that would be very informative to allow us to make breakthroughs and to interpret the results in a way that could directly relate to patients. So what our research is focused on, recruiting patients that have specific types of neurodevelopmental disorders where we think we can find the cause. And I'll give you two brief examples. One is we do a lot of recruitment in parts of the world where parents tend to marry their relatives. So that's called uh, consanguinity. And we work a lot in parts of the world where this is 100 times higher rates than in the US, in parts of the Middle East, North Africa, Central Asia, these kinds of places. We go into those regions, find patients with particular conditions that uh, we're interested in solving. We solve those cases. Um, those cases can be solved because uh, we can apply some genetic tricks. It's much simpler to work with those sorts of families. Once we find the gene, then we bring it back to our patients here in the US and we advance that, that cause. So using that approach, we found something like 100 new causes of neurodevelopmental disorders that run the range from autism, structural brain disease, uh, epilepsy, um, some neuro pediatric neurodegenerative diseases. It's, it's almost limitless what you can do with that sort of approach. What we found with that approach is that some of these cases, we didn't know, but they have treatable conditions mm -hmm. underlying it. When we dig down into the uh, into individual genetic contributions to these conditions, we see there's thousands of individual contributions, some of which can be treated in ways we never imagined once we find the cause. So you begin with a population that's enriched for disorders that are neurological disorders. Right. <clears throat> and you examine those patients and you confirm, yeah, these are the clinical findings. And then you sequence their DNA and you come up with genes that are likely or certainly involved and causative of the change in brain function. And then you study those genes and what they do, but what you're saying is some of those genes immediately suggest to you that uh, a treatment of one kind or another might work. Yeah, that was put very nicely. We have a number of examples where we follow that exact paradigm where just by sequencing the child's DNA, we can uncover a new cause of a condition we then screen the population at large for those mutations and develop animal models in the laboratory to test treatments. And once we have one that, that works, um, that, is a, that uh, came to us by understanding the, gen the gene, then we bring that back into patients. So we have a new, uh, we, uh, uh, two years ago, we described the first treatable cause of autism that's known. It's a mutation in a gene that causes the body to uh, handle certain nutrients in ways that are not, not typical. So the body um, hypermetabolizes one form of a, of a nutrient that we take, take in. These patients with this condition looked just like any other patient in the autism clinic. But we would never have been able to identify them as being unique until we'd sequenced their DNA. Now we have a biomarker for that condition. I'm starting to get a lot of calls from physicians around the world that have uncovered these same patients with the same kind of condition, and this condition is treatable. We showed that with a biomarker response, and this is now being put into clinical trials. So we're very excited about this, and, and using um, a genetic framework to 
tease apart the individual contributions to autism, figure out which ones are treatable easily, and the ones that are going to need more work, then we can get started on those kinds of studies. The power here is that by taking <clears throat> a population that has an increased probability of having a defective gene, two copies in, in a child, you've learned enough about the biology of this that you can help the general population. So the, it's the Mideast to UCSD connection that's actually enhancing life both in the Middle East and in San Diego and in America. That's the paradigm that we like to put forward. It's, it's using special populations to make discoveries and then translating that to the general population. And the way we're trying to translate that now most tangibly is with this uh, new precision medicine effort that's in a partnership between UCSD and Rady Children's Hospital. Um, I'm playing a role there as director of neuroscience and we have some great plans to um, improve the way we diagnose children in the city, throughout the city, and improve the quality of these lives. Talk a little bit about personalized medicine as it applies to what you're looking at and about the effort at Rady. Well, it's interesting, the effort at Rady Children's Hospital is unlike anything else that's, I, to my knowledge, ever been, ever been really uh, attempted before because our goal is not to make scientific dis discoveries. Our goal is, is measured in quality adjusted life years. And this is a metric that basic scientists or even clinicians don't really use very much, but it is really a measurement how much we can tip that scale um, in the favor of improved quality adjusted life years. That means is the child having a better quality of life for more years than prior to the treatment? Mm -hmm. And um, so with that goal in mind, it changes everything about how we approach individual patients, or how we approach individual research subjects. How do you do it, Joe? What's the, what's the secret sauce of, of what you're pursuing now at Rady? Well, we want to make the uh, most important, go for the low-lying low fruit first, and we've decided for the time being to focus on, on three areas. One is newborn disease, because uh, newborns are at their most vulnerable. Right? When they're born, we don't know anything about a newborn. It's, it's a, a child sitting there who can be very sick in the ICU, and we have a real opportunity if we can change the course of events that that child will have their whole life to benefit. So the approach we're taking is to bring very rapid DNA sequencing to the bedside. So we've installed sequencers at the hospital, and within 24 hours of a baby being born, we can have their entire genetic sequence open before us, and we can make changes to the care, and we have saved lives, and we continue to advance this approach. It's not being done anywhere else in the world, 24-hour turnaround time for sequencing, the fastest other places around maybe a month or something like this. This is an orders of magnitude improvement in the, in the rapidity with which we can approach these patients and affect care. And it sounds like the, the likelihood that one will impact care is pretty good. That, that it isn't just the ability to sequence quickly, but that the data that you get from this does change therapy. Not in every case, but in the cases where it does change therapy, it changes it in measurable ways. And we're, we're, we're getting a lot of experience now in figuring out which, which patients are going to benefit the most. Mm -hmm. um, to, it turns out that brain disease is a really important area to consider, of course, because the brain is the one organ that really can't repair itself once it's damaged. And so this is the point where we think we have the biggest potential to change lives if we can get in and diagnose brain diseases early. Mm -hmm. So many examples of children with um, severe onset seizures in the newborn period where we can make a genetic diagnosis mm -hmm. and now we can say, uh, well, we want to avoid that drug and maybe try this drug or we now know what to expect from the natural history of the child over the next couple of weeks. It's not a, a mystery at this point. We can call up our friends and colleagues in other places that have put natural history studies together or doing clinical trials that are based upon the genetic sequence of the mutation. And it's just a complete change in the paradigm of how we think about treating patients. Very formidable. What other populations are you targeting? So in addition to the Middle East, we're looking at, at patients that have had surgery for epilepsy. and and the thinking in epilepsy has changed in the last 10 years or so, especially in, in child neurology. As you know, if a child presents with severe epilepsy uh, associated with autism, uh, we think earlier and earlier about a surgical approach because in many cases there'll be a little spot in the brain that's abnormal that is the seed for the epilepsy, almost like a cancer in the brain 
that is firing constantly and spreading um, this, these abnormal uh, brain waves around the brain that has two effects. One, it causes seizures, and the second is that it kind of erases memory in a way that we you know, really understand fully, but it definitely impacts uh, cognition and learning, and, and the children stop developing uh, and language skills and motor skills once severe seizures start. So um, we, are re we are recruiting patients that are undergoing surgery to remove these lesions, and then we're performing the same sort of sequencing approach to spot mutations in the brain that have the potential to be, uh, to be targeted with therapy. What we found so far, very excitingly, we found three genes in particular that seem to make the major contribution now in around two-thirds of these cases. We can, we can make a diagnosis with, um, after surgery by sequencing this bit of tissue that's abnormal. Importantly, once that piece of tissue is removed, by and large, if, if it's, the surgery is done well and it's the right piece, the patients don't have any more seizures. Mm -hmm. That's the most remarkable thing. This, the surgery can be curative, but still brain surgery, and we'd like to be able to avoid it if, it's po if possible. So by understanding the genetic contributions, we can begin to, to, to tease apart the pathophysiology of, of this condition. What we found are mutations in a specific pathway called the mTOR pathway. All these genes, the three genes that we found, are all in the same pathway. And there's a very clear readout for this pathway that we can see under the microscope. And looking at the patient's uh, brain samples, we can see they're all terribly activated for this abnormal signaling pathway. It's, it's one of the same pathways that is activated in cancer, but these lesions don't undergo um, cell division like, like in cancer. But importantly, it suggests a very specific treatment. So there's another example where just having the sequence, understanding the mutation, there's already drugs that target this pathway that are now being put into clinical trials. We're very excited about supporting the clinical trials. Um, our lab is not the kind of place we can run one of these, but we're just so excited to see this kind of treatment. Nobody would have guessed this was the treatment before the genetic work was done. It's a, it's a really exciting new world to think that by looking even at rare disorders and understanding the genetic basis, we can think differently about treatment and also prognosis and, quite frankly, as regards children changing their lives for, for, for good and, and for a very long time. It's exciting. Well, that's why you and I went into pediatrics, I think, because we knew that uh, if we could change the life of a child in, an, in a positive way, they'd have their whole life to benefit. And I firmly believe that. And I, I go to work every day with that belief. And it's what keeps me going, for sure. Thanks for keeping going. We're proud of you, Joe. Thanks for being on the program. Thanks so much. Bill Mobley for The Brain Channel.